I've been trying to brainstorm some more practical examples for all the techniques we've learned about the cross product, and I came up with several different types of scenes that uses the cross product to either drive the animated motions or add a bit of procedural intelligence to sell the look. In this scene, I have Eric trying to grab a ball that floats all over in front of him. The interesting feature is the hand switching. I was able to add a bit of intelligence to Eric and have his hand switch over to whichever hand is closest to the ball. This is what a normal human would do rather than a robotic motion from a single hand trying to grab something that's too far away. Using the cross product techniques taught throughout the past weeks, I'm able to easily make this procedural rig a little more intelligent to sell the look. And it's completely procedurally driven, no manual keyframes. Eric switches hands to whichever is closest to the ball based on all that left right detection stuff we've learned from basic concept number four. All those videos didn't go to waste. Can you see the two vectors that I'm trying to calculate in the cross product data in this setup with Eric trying to grab the ball? Where is Eric facing? Where are the relative vectors? The front vector is the direction where Eric is facing when he's standing still. The vector to the moving object, in this case, it's the ball, is calculated by subtracting the position of the ball to Eric's position in order to get that relative vector. Now, all these vectors are in 3D space, so we need to project it down to the ground for easier calculations. And since we only need the left-right results, which is only relevant to the XZ plane, in this case, it's the ground. Using that crude projection method shown in previous videos, we'll just take out the Y value. This is a crude method, but will give us the correct directions, and it's easy. Now we have two vectors. And by following the steps shown in previous videos, the rest of the cross product calculations should be straightforward. In this video, I'm only going to focus on illustrating examples of what the cross product can be used for and showcase various practical examples. If you're looking for an explanation on how the cross product and its calculations work, you'll need to refresh on previous videos where it was already covered. Since Eric was easy enough to grab things, I started turning heads. Using crowds and more kinefics, I made Rob turn his head to stuff that was on his right, like he was window shopping. I'll get into more details on this one a little later in the video, and I'll explain why this is a little more than just a look at constraint. The vellum paper tornado is probably familiar to those that watch my channel closely. I have shown this a few times in the past. I've given the vellum paper torna tornado a new look with uh, a new background, but the setup is the same. And again, it's a tornado motion driven by the cross product. This is all based on basic concepts number two and three. The main focus of this video is not KineFX, but I know a lot of my cross product examples in this video are based on KineFX. I don't know what to tell you. KineFX is fun. Once you start getting into KineFX, you end up getting into crowds and you won't be able to stop. I really wanted to showcase how the cross product can be applied to different types of situations. There was this short animation that I showed in my previous video where I was using the cross product to align vectors. I had these mesh letters that were deforming towards a glowing ball, which was very similar to another example of the concert hall chairs aligning towards a sphere in front of the hall where they were all using the side area to align the rotations of all the objects. Both of these examples didn't really illustrate the potential of the cross product in more practical needs. I'm hoping this video will trigger some of your brain cells and lead you to more creative ways of applying the cross product to your own projects. The left right detector technique from basic concept number four was extremely useful for this scene to tell Eric to swap hands when the ball gets closer to the other hand. The ball is powered by several different sine and cosine waves combined together with a couple of transforms layered on top. I wanted a procedural animation with a bit of complex motion to test out the hand switching. Sometimes the ball heads upwards on the right and sometimes it heads downwards. So the hand switching isn't tied to any sort of pattern. Eric is based on real time calculations. 
The best advantage of using the cross product to drive the hand switching is that we can add our own special sauce to the whole setup. For example, when detecting the straight detection, we can tell Eric to grab the ball with both hands. I also added some hip motion to sell the look. Eric's hips turns left right following the ball to help him get his hands closer to the moving ball, which is also driven by the signed area demonstrated from the previous videos related to cross product. The signed area value doesn't map exactly to the rotational range of the hips, so we do need to use Houdini's fit range to remap the range from the min and max values of the signed area to a certain degree range. Now I'm not going to use the full 90 degrees because if the hips turn 90 degrees, it would look really weird. We only need around 45 degrees left and right. So I mapped the signed area min and max values to negative 45 degrees and 45 degrees to the hips. This will help sell the look to make Eric look like he's turning a little bit more natural. After digging into more of Kinefx, I couldn't just stop there. I had to try and put all this into a crowd sim. My first thought was that it's simple enough thanks to the cross product and a bit of Kinefx rigging. The only issue I had was how to get the Kinefx and crowds to work with each other. But it all turns out that you can do things one phase at a time. This is very similar to the process where I showed in RBD and Vellum interaction video I did before. No relation to this video though. The workflow is similar though. How you take the results of one simulated scene and feed it into a new simulation to get it working together. The only way I could get both of these systems working together on my short schedule was one phase at a time. I took the simulated crowds of Rob's walking up and down a street, very simple crowd simulation setup, then feed all that crowd sim data into a for each loop and a wrangle to calculate the angle for each individual Rob agent to turn Rob's head and stare at random stuff on his right. I did play around with this one and made variations. Sometimes I made Rob stare at the closest point to the side of the curve, as though he was window shopping. Being able to control where the characters are looking at and to do this procedurally adds a lot of interesting behavior to the crowds for my urban city scene. You can argue that you may be able to create the similar effect with Kinefx's uh, look at constraint. However, the Kinefx look at constraint would lock the character's eyesight on a single object. Where using the cross product to control where the character is looking at, we have more control over the whole setup. And what I've done here is look at the closest point to the character's right and figure out the angle needed to turn Rob's head so he stares at the object. There's also a bunch of stuff I need to do for this scene. For example, I could add some more blending to his head turning motion when Rob turns his head. Right now it's a little rough. Because Rob's head is snapping in and out when his head turns towards the object, which looks like something like a glitch. But because there's enough of Rob agents on the floor, I think that glitch isn't as bad as it sounds. I barely had enough time to make it for this video, so I'll release a more refined version a uh, at a later date. Since all the characters are just staring at the right, it means only the agents walking up the street will be staring at the shops. Because the shops are only at the right when they're walking in that direction, for all the agents walking down the street coming from the opposite side, nothing will be on the right, which isn't as interesting. I then added some random points on both sides of the curves. So what you end up getting is a weird scene where all the agents are looking to their right. It's like they're trying to avoid eye contact with anyone. You have a lot of fun with this. I wanted something more procedural so I would be able to experiment with the scene by changing the left right directions to get a different behavior. We can't forget the previous old project I did with Vellum Paper Tornadoes, which uses the cross product to calculate the velocity field of a tornado motion. 
This was actually an older project that I taught and retaught again with more details and eventually became cross product, basic concept number two and three. The concept is very simple. You take a starting point and two vectors I've exposed as a parameter, the up vector and center vector to create variations of spiral motions. Apply the cross product on both vectors and keep doing this again and again. And eventually you'll find that you've got a tornado spiral like motion, which again was basic concept number two and three, and then convert this into a velocity field and feed it into the vellum simulation, which was previously also shown in a live stream tutorial video. Once you have this velocity field, you can actually feed it into so many different types of simulations like pyro, RBD, flip, and as you see right now, vellum. Lastly, I know this example might not be the most interesting one, but it is a simple one and I felt the need to at least go over how the cross product and signed area are driving the letters bending. The signed area value calculated from the crude projection method shown from the previous basic constant number four, yes, that signed area value is fed into the angle of the bend geometry node. That's about it. I mean, you do need a lot of geometry and asset creation, but it was all pretty straightforward. Using any drawing program, print out the letters onto an image. You can use the font node in Houdini to generate the text geometry, but I do prefer using Illustrator to generate the images because Adobe has a lot of fonts. Whatever works for you. If you generate an image with text, you can use Houdini's trace node to turn the image into geometry and extrude it out. The remeshing is for better topology and all the cross product calculations are done here. And lastly, we feed in that uh, signed area function remap to certain angles used to bend the letter mesh. And that happens in these uh, for loops that are looping through each letter. So each letter is actually bending in a different uh, angle or a different direction. The bending is done using two bend nodes, one for up and down movement and another bend node is used for the left and right movement. Both bend nodes are driven by two different signed area values that are calculated based on two different projection planes. The left and right motions are calculated by projecting the vectors to the X, Z plane and the up and down motions are calculated by projecting the vectors to the X, Y plane. These are just some of the ways the cross product is used as a main tool to help drive different animations. Most of my examples are kept as simple as I could make them while still showcasing the power of the cross product. I find that the cross product is useful in cases where you least expect it to be. It's a handy tool to keep on your list of skill sets and it'll always be there when you need it for that random task you need while modeling something or that one time you needed a solution to tell Houdini left from right. You never know. All these projects will be available for my perk members and I am thinking of going into more detail on how each project work as a separate video topic. But let's see how my schedule goes. Let me know if there are any questions regarding the projects. I do have a whole lineup of mocap topics I really want to get into. Just look at my recent blog on my new mocap devlog. I'm trying to get finger tracking to work using a webcam running at 90 FPS. And there's a lot of cross product going into figuring out how to retarget the motion captured from a webcam and transfer it onto a 3D character. The knowledge of all the cross product goodness is being very helpful in this process. But everything is still in the works. Thanks for watching and sticking to the end.